Okay, hi everyone. My name is Karis and welcome to our sixth workshop of the series. So two more to go. Um, today we're going to be discussing music marketing with Ola from Indoor Recess and Lynn Bangs from Icon Island. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I am your moderator, first of all, <laughs> for all these workshops. I am a singer, songwriter, music producer. Uh, started out primarily on the creative side of things. And then two years ago, I uh, decided to study music business. And from there, I've kind of immersed myself in the business side of things. Um, kind of spent the last two years just getting involved in opportunities such as Afrowave. Um, so a little bit about Afrowave for those that are that haven't been on or are not aware of Afrowave. Um, so it's a new music initiative that was started by Lexicon, um, a Toronto-based artist. He works in dancehall and through his work and through his journey as an artist, um, especially being in Toronto, he kind of recognized that there weren't a lot of platforms um, for him to expose his music, um, particularly because of the genre and um, realized that this experience was shared by peers in similar genres such as reggaeton, soca, um, reggae. And so he decided to create this platform to kind of bridge that gap, um, to allow people in more of these culturally driven sounds to you know, have an opportunity for exposure, also to provide resources such as these workshops for those artists so that um, you, know, you can further your career and, and help with artist development in that way. Uh, so, once again, we have Ola and we have Lynn. We're gonna give them an opportunity to tell us a little bit about themselves and how they got started in music marketing um, in a little bit, just so that the attendees are aware. We will have a question and answer section around seven. If you do have a pressing question, feel free to put it in the chat and we will discuss, kind of keep it more of a conversational format. Um, and should anyone get dropped, technology we'll just come back in pretend like it didn't happen <laughs> keep it going all right so Ola tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in music sure well thank you Karis and Lynn it's it's nice to be here with both of you and appreciate being included it's a huge honor love Afrowave um and and uh everything a part of the collective and what you do. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so music is my life vocation is how I describe it, really. Um, I, I I live I live it, I breathe it, eat it, sleep it. Music is my life. Um, I got started as a music journalist, a music and culture journalist um, with roots covering the heavy metal music scene, actually. So I come from, uh, you know, covering extreme metal and it's uh, global subgenres and uh, got my start writing in high school for a variety of webzines and then later on moved into different types of culture reporting. I worked for uh, Women's Lifestyle, print magazine, um, did a lot of different things with managing, man you know, being a managing editor type, uh, features editor, um, roles, things like that. Uh, and moved into, um, later on, I, I, I uh, got a role while I was in university. I went to Ryerson for journalism. And while at Ryerson, I um, uh, discovered an opportunity at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, which is a Canadian art landmark, uh, primarily for Canadian art and also a lot of international artists that come through and indigenous art from Canada. And um, I actually volunteered there as a kid. And uh, later on, there was a communications-based role to be a project coordinator for an accessibility initiative at the gallery. Uh, essentially, they got a grant from the Accessibility Director of Ontario to help them develop and deliver accessible art programs for people living with um, diverse abilities. And the final deliverable was a government guidelines document for other arts and cultural organizations and how they can do similar work. And so that was my role. I spearheaded that project for over two years. Uh, and then, you know, was in other roles at the gallery, including uh, in development and donor relations, uh, event management at the gallery. And once those contracts ended, um, I was at a bit of a crossroads with not knowing if I were going to go back into journalism or go into project management. Um, but there was something really um, uh, calling me to advocate, to do something around advocacy, because I, I was working in accessibility and I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in the nonprofit sector 
Um, but there was also something really pulling me back to music and the arts because at the time I started freelancing again, I was writing for Noisy and things like that. So there was something pulling me back there. Uh, and lo and behold, there was a role at Indoor Recess where I have been for almost five years. We are a hybrid management and uh, music uh, public relations agency based in Toronto. And uh, there was a role, there was a position available and I felt that uh, a publicist would be the next move for me, merging that project coordination uh, with my communication skills and background, uh, because it's still a, a method of advocacy for the arts and, and sharing that passion. Um, so that's where I am now. And yeah, as mentioned, we are based in Toronto, uh, hybrid um, management and media relations agency, and we cover um, artists from Canada and around the world. So it's 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 been a big blessing. I've learned a lot and. Uh, yeah, I, I continue to, to push music in other areas of my life. I, I think about it all the time. So, <laughs> and also advocacy on various levels. So yeah, that's a, a bit about me, a bit. Yeah. Right. And Lynn? That's amazing. Um, yeah, uh, similar, eat, breathe, live music all day, every day, <laughs> consumed in all ways. Um, I started in music about 10 years ago. Um, when I first moved to Toronto, um, I knew nobody and I knew nothing. Um, so the best way for me to kind of get myself into the community was I started an event. Because um, also 10 years ago, that was like where you needed to be if you wanted to be an artist and get opportunity. Um, and so I started an event. Um, I did everything from being the door girl to helping sell tickets to all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I built my way up. Um, I started being able to be more of a major part of the concerts of like buying into talent and stuff like that. Um, I got to be a part of some really big shows like back in the day with like the Mac Miller tour, the Machine Gun Kelly tour, all that kind of stuff. I was mainly like kind of in hip hop at that point. Um, and then from there, I kind of just like realized like events is really draining and it takes a takes the life out of you it ages you pretty quickly so um within the doing events I was giving a lot of artists opportunity to kind of like open up and connecting them to people and then I started kind of moving into like a manager role because I had so many kind of opportunities at hand and uh within managing artists I then decided I would go to school for that because I thought it made sense that I know this much but I feel like I'm missing a lot more so mm -hmm. I started uh, going to school for entertainment management. Um, I then met my business partners at the time. They were building a music studio. We partnered and created like an incubator out of the studio where we were developing artists. And uh, that's when we signed like, we signed like Yoko Gold and he was the brother of Tory Lanez. And we did a Euro tour with them and we did all kinds of stuff. Um, that was quite a few years ago. And then from there, uh, we kind of branched apart because we had like different ideas of how we wanted to run the business and stuff. And then, Luckily, uh, about three years ago, I launched Icon. And then um, within all of those different things I did within the music industry, I realized like marketing was kind of what I was always most interested in and like best at within our team. So I decided to launch Icon as strictly a marketing agency at the time because I needed a little break from kind of managing day to day. Yeah. And uh, within that, it was really exciting because I still got to work with artists on a daily basis. I still got to do what I loved but it was always interesting and new because I was working with someone new and doing a different project and working on this and working on that. So um, within Icon, I've been launched for the last three years, worked with some big names like Charlie XCX, Lil Baby, have worked with some labels. I've also worked with some indie artists and helped them really like launch their career into um, a good place of like getting distro deals or getting investors or whatever the case is. And uh, recently within the last year, I've also now reopened my management slash indie label side of the business I signed one artist um in the last year we've had tons of success we hit a million streams we just got them verified um we were doing lots of shows and stuff before COVID hit um we got we've gotten lucky during COVID to do some virtual shows and stuff like that but right now the two main things are Icon as a marketing agency and then Icon the indie label on the side so two of them kind of merge as one nice so yeah. We have online publicity and then Lynn, you're in marketing. Um, can you guys kind of break down for us what the difference is between marketing and publicity? I don't know who wants. Lynn, maybe you want to take a shot at that for us? Sure. Um, you can probably get better insight, but uh, we do some PR, but more digital PR only. We don't mm -hmm. really set up like 
you know, media interviews or television or anything at that capacity. Um, but basically, for me, the major difference between marketing and publicity is marketing is promoting your music to different audiences and getting your face in other eyes, mm. as opposed to publicity is getting yourself written about and getting media coverage. So whether it's, you know, an online article, a physical article, getting television placement, getting an interview, anything like that. So it's more of media publication as opposed to marketing is more so promoting yourself in, in all mediums, really. Nice. Anything to add, Ola? Yeah, to add to Lynn's note, which is exactly that, um, marketing is is more of that, yeah, the digital outreach and getting the content in different places, whereas publicity is more of the story, the narrative, more of that information sharing uh, around that product per se, in the case of, for us, it's music, right, or the artist. So for us, it's more about developing relationships with various media and getting the story out and facilitating that process of getting that story and that narrative out and garnering that attention to what that is. Um, whereas marketing is just is, is, is um, a part of that and getting it in various places. So, yeah. so what does your role look like? Um, in 2020 especially with this pandemic now what are some of the things that you would be doing on a daily basis for an artist per se Oleg feel free to just continue yeah, yeah sure um well I'm sure Lynn can, can attest to this but a lot of emails <laughs> a lot of emails and phone calls communication is key and and in our case now we're not um in meetings in person with people as often as we were yeah. right and that's something I miss too like it's nice when you're able to engage with your client and for yeah. us we if a client is based in Toronto which a lot of our artists uh on the roster are many are and if we have a client that comes in from out of town on a tour we facilitate that press day with them we are there with them all day we go to CBC with them for an interview mm -hmm. um things like that or sometimes you have to connect a phone call if they're on a different time zone things like that um, so at the, you know, before all this, we would be doing a lot of in-person connection with people, um, and, and clients, uh, but the day-to-day -day is, is a lot of pitching, a lot of emails, um, sometimes phone calls if things are urgent or things come up today. I had a last minute, um, interview request for like a time sensitive, um, uh, feature and the outlet was looking for multiple artists to contribute. So I had to, you know, yeah. um, figure that out in a short amount of time. So stuff like that comes up, but. It's a lot of outreach, it's a lot of pitching, um, it's a lot of writing, uh, sometimes a lot of copywriting and preparing press releases. So organizing that document, putting it together. And some days you're also just organizing your files and your assets. So like looking at your, you know, your, your folders for your artists and putting together um, stuff for the campaign and arranging that and organizing it. But um, it, it's soliciting and a lot of outreach to um, online media, TV, print, um, uh, radio in our case we don't do commercial radio but we cover uh, CBC campus community radio um, outlets like that uh, setting things up scheduling following up <laughs> just a lot of communication on the day-to-day -day. so that that's that's the main thing um, and and of course now if we do take meetings they're virtual so mm -hmm. you know also connecting with your clients and checking in and for the market inside then what does it look like for you yeah, I mean, same thing. Everything we do is digital. So it's like <laughs> online all day, every day. I'm actually trying to find a good balance of like taking time off my computer because if not, yeah. I'm just sitting here all day, every day. Um, but yeah, it's all online at this point. A lot of email communication. Um, and because like you said, you can't meet with clients anymore. Everyone wants to get on a call all the time. So mm -hmm. trying to balance like getting on calls, but also being like, hey, we don't have a check-in. Like we'll update you in a few days when we have a check-in and then we can get on a call and sort of yeah. just figuring out the balance of like, you know, um, getting things done, but then also like having a, a new check-in process because everything before was like, oh, we'd meet up with you, we'd create a game plan and then we'd go digital from there and then we'd send you like X amount of reports or whatever. And then now we are not meeting with you, you know, like you said, you're having virtual meetings, trying to figure things out. So uh, it's a little bit different because I feel like I'm an extrovert and I'm definitely a people connector. And um, I kind of miss like the lives because I feel like you can read someone's energy way better and like read their body language and stuff. And like, I feel like I can't do that now. And I'm always like, 
are you good? We're good. Are you good? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, it's all digital now, like just managing emails, um, you know, managing our project schedule too. Just like, I mean, especially with us, I feel like, and I'm sure with you too, it's like everything's moved to digital now. Yeah. Like there's yeah. nothing else we can do. So with us, it was like increasing workload, but also like making sure we're taking care of ourselves because yeah. we're all still stuck in a pandemic, but like we have to get work done. Yeah. So figuring out, you know, how to do things at a bigger mass scale too, because now all those budgets that went into touring and all these different things um, have now been redirected into like digital marketing. So mm -hmm. it's just really more so day to day figuring out like, how can we really take things to the next level? You know, have you found that it's been more challenging or do you think that it's uh, benefited you in some way? The, the whole pandemic having to switch things around, like for example, for, uh, for us with Afrowave, we were like in person, just solely in person. It was just um, started, it started out as live showcases. So we'd have 10 to 15 artists, um, book a venue, line everybody up, sound check, everything, just your, your typical like mini concert. And then with COVID, we had to switch everything to virtual and we're like, well, monthly virtual concerts just aren't going to cut it. <laughs> so we have to find something else that's going to, you know, capture that audience. And so for us, like, that's how this whole workshop series was born in terms of trying to think outside the box. So it's kind of, on one hand, we don't get, we've worked around the virtual concerts. We actually ha um, have that coming up after the workshop series. Um, and that kind of gave us another way of reaching people online and, and a wider audience as well, because I found that even with the in-person stuff, it was kind of limited to people who are in and around Toronto because that's where the venue was. Um, and so overall, I think it's benefited us um, to kind of be able to think outside the box. But I want to hear about like your opinion on your side. What has it been like? Um, at least we could start with you, Lynn. What has it been like? Has it been more of a negative for you or more of a positive? I think it's been both. I think it's been a blessing and a curse because, mm -hmm. you know, um, we had a lot planned for this year, I'm sure like everyone else. And then, you know, like you said, you just kind of get sidetracked and you're like, oh shoot, like now what do I do? Yeah. I think the biggest challenge for me was like being home so much because I have so much energy and I'm mm -hmm. such an energetic, like extrovert. Like that's yeah. so my personality, you know? Like I just want to like connect and like I come home at the end of the night and I'm not burnt out. I'm like more energized. Yeah. But like being home all the time, I'm like burnt out. But like for work purposes, like I feel like what became the challenge really for this year was we got really lucky because unlike other businesses, like you said, we were set up virtually yeah. and digitally, like because we that we that's what we do. So we weren't challenged in that way. But what we were challenged with is the fact that everyone's at home, everyone's on their phone, everyone's looking at screens twenty four seven, mm -hmm. and now people are seriously taking like like time where they're like I turn off my phone at seven o'clock and I don't come back online until 9 a.m because I need that break because all I'm doing is online all day like I'm working online all day I'm on social media I'm on YouTube like I'm so bored I'm just online so we found the challenge was really coming up with new unique different digital marketing ways to capture people's attention because like the regular stuff just wasn't cutting it anymore you know yeah. like it was it was still you know the stereotypical Instagram Facebook ads still work but now like every company, every artist, major artists, like, you know, are dominating those areas because they're also stuck at home. So yeah. now you're competing with like, I have a thousand dollar ad budget and Drake has unlimited. So mm -hmm. obviously he can dominate me in the ad world and do way more ads and get way more seen than me. So now I'm competing for that space. So it becomes a little trickier where you're like, okay, now I have to find out ways where we can do certain things. And like you said, even trying to get people to come to virtual workshops or virtual concerts, you think that would be really easy because you're like, oh, well, they're just sitting in their living room. But it's yeah. actually very hard. Like it's way harder because like in person, it's a whole experience. But online, it's like I'm just staring at my screen like I've been doing all day long. So yeah. I think those are some of like the main challenges like we face and like I feel like artists face too because they were like, well, how do I engage people, you mm -hmm. know, when I can't like really do anything. And I think that's like, been the biggest challenge of the year I think we figured out some things but I think there's still a lot of learning and growing for us to do for sure makes sense Ola yeah definitely definitely can relate to that and trying to navigate the the virtual concert world for yeah. sure 
Um, but yeah, another big one for us too. We go to shows a lot. Like I, I am at shows very often in the week, back to back or press days that are back to back to back appointments. And then you have a show that evening. So it's, it's very busy. Um, still very busy, gratefully. Uh, and it, it's, it's been pretty good. I think the beginning of the pandemic uh, was interesting to navigate because people were still trying to figure out um, digital uh, uh, methods of how to do interviews and how to do live streams or pre-taped sessions. And there are many outlets that do offer like pre-taped options to do things, but um, where those where there are spaces where you would typically, like I mentioned before, bring a client to do something, uh, go into the studio to do a live session or interview, even if it's taped, like, you know, there, there are logistics now. And even so the quality of doing something through Zoom or Skype is never going to be, is never going to compare to the live quality and energy that an artist brings when they are in studio and there's that beautiful equipment. Um, and not even that, just the, the, the engagement with that person in front of you, whether it's the audience or the producer in the studio, you know, um, recording your, your session. So I think that has been something that, that has um, been an impact, um, uh, but it has been positive and negative. Um, artists are still releasing albums. They're getting creative. I think going into the summer, we're seeing that a lot more people starting to get on their toes a bit and starting to strategize and learn, okay, what is working and what isn't working? How can I be creative? How can I be innovative in this time and figure it out? We've, art we've had artists that have, you know, released two EPs within like eight months because they've had that time of reflection and introspection and creation and a period where they can put all of their energy into creating something cathartic or something that can inspire audiences to uh, gravitate towards a sense of joy. So it, it's been a blessing and also challenging because um, you um, are having to compete with a lot. You're having to compete with a lot of people uh, focusing on various aspects of um, being online in digital spaces, as Lynn mentioned, you know, people are also getting very burnt out by consuming the one space that they're able to share with the entire world, right? A venue is a space you're, you're able to share with a certain amount of people and the artists. It's intimate. It's personal. It's a once in a lifetime moment. Digital world is not like that. It's not like that. You can go back and watch that live stream a bunch of times. You might get bored. You know, it, it doesn't have the same engagement. Not to say that it's bad. Um, I'm an old school person. As you can see, there's 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 records behind me because yes, I play records. And I, I love that. So, I mean, I might not be the best person to ask at times because I'm just super old school in that fact yeah. of like a human condition and what we need as people. Um, so that's definitely been a challenge. And, and also in, in, you know, with that too, we're also in a time where at the beginning of this for news coverage, um, a lot of outlets were um, minimizing the amount of arts coverage that they were doing because a lot of um, uh, journalists or people on the editorial teams had to shift towards covering the pandemic, right? Even now, election season, you know, people say don't, unless you have a song that, that relates to it, don't release any music during election week because, uh, you know, it might get buried under, under the news. Yeah. It's just, it's trying to stay on top of everything that's happening. And essentially everything is happening all the time now. We're not just pivoting around holidays and things like that. It's, it's, it's a global thing, so. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think the letter, like what I've noticed um, being an artist myself and even being in school, uh, the latter part of the year is kind of like a no-no almost because then you're competing with Christmas after. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that people have their, their classics that they run to, like All I Want for Christmas still plays I think that song's probably one of the most streamed ever um so it's I guess it's it's pretty interesting to, to see how you how you would schedule things especially during this time um like you mentioned there are a lot of people that are kind of more connected with their art now and that because you're home and most of us are home and have the time to do that um one of the things that we talked about in a previous workshop a couple of the workshops was um how how much increase in collaboration there has been now because people are kind of forced to look outside of themselves and connect with, well, you have an opportunity now to connect with so many other people because we're all kind of in the same situation. Um, so I think 
that too has kind of been a, a benefit in the music world. Um, but the other question I wanted to direct was, I think one of the hot topics that we've had in terms of around getting a professional team in any way, we had this with the management workshop um, and kind of pose it in terms of so many people are home now. A lot of people have decided that music is what they want to do and what they want to pursue professionally. Um, a lot of our attendees are in that boat. When do you think, um, I guess Lynn, you could jump on this one, that an artist should start looking for professional marketing help? Um, in terms of professional marketing, I think it's more so not about like what stage they're at. I think mm -hmm. it's more about what the plan is and what content they have. Because I mean, if you're an artist and you're just like releasing, let's say your first like, you know, few songs and you just want to kind of test out the market and start building some small fans and build up to a level where you're like, oh, now I have a big enough budget to hire a PR or hire a marketing team. Um, you're probably going to want to do it yourself for a little bit because realistically as like an indie artist, it's a lot cheaper to come up with a hundred, 200 bucks. I mean, especially in a pandemic to put towards marketing than it is a thousand, 2000, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's not to say that I only work with a thousand dollar budget. We definitely work with a lot cheaper than that, but it's just to say that, you know, to make a really big impact, you have to have a decent budget. You know what I mean? You can't, the music industry, I think we, so much of the time see the end result but we have no idea how much money or time or effort or players went into that end result so we think like oh like yeah like like you would be mind blown about how many artists came up every day like yeah i want to run a tiktok campaign and i'm like do you know how much a tiktok campaign is like like a tiktok influencer with like a million followers is anywhere depending on how good their engagement is is literally anywhere from like 400 to like 700 bucks and that's just if you like reached out to them on your own by yourself, you know what I mean? But as an indie artist, if you only have, let's say a hundred or 200 bucks, you could go and find someone yourself with maybe a hundred thousand, 200,000 followers and get them to do a video. You know what I mean? As opposed to working with like a bigger scale. So I think it's like just realizing where you're at and being like, Hey, like I'm not at a place where I have a huge, like six month game plan for my music or a year long game plan. I don't really need a huge team or machine behind me to really ramp things up. You know, I think if you just have like one single and you're just going to put that single out and then kind of ride that and see what happens and test the reaction. And then maybe three months later, like put another single out and you're kind of doing things a bit more like slow pace. Like do it on your own. Cause it's possible, you know, like there's lots of programs out there right now mm -hmm. and platforms you can use. Like I tell artists all the time, like if you can't hire someone to do like your professional Facebook or Instagram ads, there's a website called Tone Den and you can go and use Tone Den and they have like playbooks set up. So like, if you want to know how to like grow your Spotify streams from an Instagram or Facebook ad, they have a pre-designed ad that you can literally just input your info and mm -hmm. it's way simpler than using like Facebook ad manager. Cause artists try and dominate Facebook ad manager. And it's like, it has 20 million options. You know what I mean? There's too many options. You're going through your like, what yeah. age target I don't know like who's like what age is going to listen to I mean you don't know that as an artist you know what I mean so yeah. there's so many options but I find tone den really simplifies it it's like what content are you pushing is it a video or is it a photo boom uploaded here great put the song in there great put five to ten similar artists that that if the, if I like that type of person I would like you boom done okay cool thank you we'll go ahead and run your ad and get you success based off of what you put into our system and we'll take we know what facebook's looking for we know what instagram's looking for we can do lookalike ads for you instead of you having to hire a professional for 500 to a thousand bucks to do that for you so i think now it's just about being smarter in the digital world and using the right tools to kind of get yourself ahead Mm -hmm. instead of dishing out tons of money because once again I understand that we're in a pandemic and for artists who don't have investors or a label or a distro company who's going to give them an advance any of those things like they might just be using you know 100 or 200 bucks out of their serve to try and get ahead you know what I mean so when the pandemic is over they can say well you know I've grown in these ways and now I can at least go out and try and book some shows or you know what I mean because coming back to your topic about shows it's like before you didn't need, you know, 
10,000 followers to book a show at a venue. You just had to have a good fan base. But now these virtual shows, they want you to have a ton of followers because that's the only way they can get an idea of like, how many viewers can you bring to our virtual festival? You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's changing everything about how opportunities work. And um, I think if you figure out a way right now, like on top of that, to also be exclusive to your audience, because like you said, like when you would go to a venue, it was very exclusive. It's like, oh my God, it's sold out. Now I can't go. I'm going to miss it. It created that sense of like, like, like FOMO, like I missed out, you know, but now, like you said, like, I don't have that because if I miss something, I'm like, whatever, I'll watch it on YouTube or I'll like watch the replay or the virtual thing will be posted. Like it does, you don't feel like it matters anymore. So if you have some sense of exclusivity with your fans as well and figuring out that, I think that's like a huge key to this like year as well. Um, I feel like that's why a lot of artists are starting like, like Patreons or like OnlyFans or like whatever, because it's like a way for them to step out and give exclusivity where it's like, well, if I, if I'm not tapped in, I, I don't get to see that. You know what I mean? So I feel like the, the, all those types of digital things are kind of changing. And I think it's, it's cool to see, but I think, yeah, we definitely have to still take, like you said, from that old school of like, what was so amazing about that old school that we loved. And then how do we like bring that into the digital world to keep that element so we don't lose that for when we do go back to whatever normal is going to look like. Mm -hmm. when things are over you know <laughs> makes sense so just to uh make sure i could uh, i got this right it's t-o-n-e-d-e-n -E -E right yeah um it's okay. tonden.io not dot com okay so i'll just add it in the chat here for everyone who may have missed it yeah and they do have um like a free option and then they also have a paid option so if okay. you don't want to do the paid option you can still use the free one it's still totally good Mm -hmm. um, and there's tons of YouTube tutorials as well on like how to effectively use it and like how to use it the best way. And is most of your work then um, around like social media and playlisting and digital ad work or is it outside of the digital world as well? No, for sure. We focus completely on digital. I mean, okay. even right now we are running like a radio campaign for one of our clients, mm -hmm. but it's all digital radio. Yeah. Um, it's not like, like FM or anything like that, you know? Um, everything is digital and our biggest focus is on conversion. So like converting the viewership into fans or listeners or subscribers mm -hmm. um, on whatever platform we're trying to dominate um, because ultimately like numbers, numbers are where it's at now, you know, <laughs> everything's about numbers. And for you, Ola, when would an artist, um, especially, well, let me say an independent artist because that's what majority of our attendees are, um, when would they be looking for professional help with pub uh, publicity or trying to get a publicist um, as part of their team? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, and, and just recapping what Lynn noted, like super important. Lynn's work is really important right now because that is that is where a lot of a lot of is. focus is. Yeah, it's 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 um, a, lot, a lot of impact. Um, uh, when would an independent artist? Uh, when would be the right time to uh, develop a team? Yeah, so. Um, it doesn't matter what level they're at. It could be independent. It could be signed to a label. It could be their debut release. It could be a you know a shorter EP. It could be a full length album. Um, they could have. It could be their third album. Um, it doesn't really matter what level you are in terms of um, your your st your stage in your career. Uh, but in terms of when you are ready uh, to reach out and go the publicity route and, and develop a team, uh, including that, I think it's when you are ready to tell your story, when you are ready to share your story, when you are ready to um, get your music out and the narrative out around that um, and, and share that in your own words, sonically, but also uh, on a more engaging personal level um, through the help and facilitation of an agency or a professional team or an independent publicist, whatever the, the situation may be. Um, also for independent artists, a lot of us know if anyone does things DIY and you're doing things with per se limited resources, I won't call them limited, it just might be a, a minimized amount because you, know, you can always create and do things with, with that, whatever resources you have, there's a way. Um, but I think 
in addition to that, if an independent artist has been doing things on their own for so long, and they have the means to uh, go to take the next step to hire someone to um, bring in from a management side or an admin side or uh, to bring a pub publicist on, I think um, that also helps them allocate and refocus their time on working on the music and, and just solely focusing on that, right? And at the time too, you know, considering music and touring, like artists only have that focus to perform and to create, right? And to, to execute that. Um, whereas you do need someone else to assist you with all, all the other areas so you can stay focused. So I think it's when an artist has the means to bring someone else on and when they value that time to share their story. I think you'll know when you feel it's right that you want to get the word out around your work. Um, and it's more so about sharing the story and the narrative around it and speaking about it and also sharing through live performances, right? So that is, I think, when when that when would be the right time for for an artist to to bring um publicity into the fold of their work um and as well when they're when they have the content when they're ready when they have a plan executed when they have an idea and an intention around that project i think that's really important too knowing where they want to take it knowing how they want to shape that campaign um and showing up with those assets as well i think that's a huge thing is, is which I'm sure we'll get into, but strategy is like having your assets and your content prepared um, and knowing what you want to do with it. And that includes marketing, PR, you know, management, having, having those support systems around you. So I think that would be the, the main, the main um, time, I guess. Yeah. For some. And when an artist does decide that, okay, like I do want to share my story now, um, probably been doing this for a while, trying to get some more attention. What is that process like if they come there like, hi, Ola, I know you work in publicity. I really want to do this. What is that process like from that moment on? Yeah, um, so if if you, for example, if you reach out to Indoor Recess or myself and you're interested in, in establishing like a publicity campaign for a project, um, you know, it all starts with that initial um, meeting and correspondence. If it, it's not, you know, if it, if it's a new situation and 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 you're connecting for the first time, um, if you're reaching out to a company or having someone else facilitate that for you, like a manager or an, or an assistant, in some cases, um, you know, you, you reach out and let them know what you're looking for. Let them know uh, what you are looking to focus on. So, for example, reaching out to an agency and saying. Um, you know, in your in inquiry that you are looking for um, publicity around an upcoming album. Um, it is set for release, you know, if you have that date in a few months, December 8th, whatever it may be. Um, and you, I, I, I'd always suggest sharing a sample of the music because the agency also has to like and vibe with what you, with what you do to be able to connect with it because um, that's really strong as well. Uh, you know, align values and also um, just really feeling and understanding what you're doing it because that will also help that process. So yeah. would always recommend sharing content that you've put out previously um, or a sample of what's to come, you know, that because if that's the thing that is in focus then share uh, a sample um, of what you are planning to release, like an overview of that sound, uh, as well as any background information about you, you know, your your bio, any accolades that you received to date, um, and fun facts about you too. What makes you human? You know what what adds personality to to the music and your work as well. Um, and sharing any other visual assets or things that would support that. But and also being very clear about your ask. You know, being very clear about what you're looking for. Are you looking for radio only? Are you are you are you going on tour? Are you doing a a, a series of online workshops or performances? Are you putting out an album? And is there's going to be some sort of visual element around it. So um, I think enlisting as much detail as possible. Um, you know, there's definitely times where we've received just a sentence that says, hey, I'm looking for PR. I'm really seeing anything. Yeah. Like that. And you're like, well, I mean, you know, that it would be great to hear something and no learn more about you. Yeah. Uh, not, that, that happens very rarely, but it happens sometimes. And I think people on the marketing PR management side, they want to know a bit about you. Um, so being very clear about what you're sharing, what your ask is, is great. And then from there, you know, you, you would have a, a discussion and, and correspond with, with that mm -hmm. person um, and decide what the next steps would be. 
um, which usually involves some sort of proposal or plan around, around um, you know, what, what the campaign would look like. Uh, and you kind of take it from there. But, but yeah, what I'll, you know, suggest sharing as much as you can or feel comfortable with. Yeah. And for you, Lynn, what does that process look like with you if an artist approaches you um, or your company says they want to, uh, you know, have some professional marketing help around a project or around some stuff that they're doing? What, what does that process look like with you? Yeah, so very same process. Like, we want to know, like, what is it that you're trying to push? You know, is it an audio single only? Is it a music video? Is it an EP? Is it an album? Um, are you doing a virtual show? Like, what are you trying to market? Because for us, it's essential for us to know what we're working with. And I feel like it's the opposite where sadly, it's not very rare for us to get that email. Like, hey, I want to do marketing. Can you send me pricing? And I'm like, I don't even know what your music sounds like. We might not even be the right fit for you. Like, yeah. we, you know what I mean? Like, there's no point for me to send you pricing if we've never even heard your music. And we have no idea what you're trying to accomplish. Um, Cause I know sadly there's obviously a lot of, you know, kind of not so legit marketing agencies on the internet and mm -hmm. their pricing is just plastered all over. And it's like, it's artists think it's as easy as like, Oh, click pay. And then I'm going to blow up on the internet, but it's not that easy. Like we have to really strategize and figure out what content do you have? Where are we pushing this content? What budget do we have to work with for this content? And then how can we hit, certain goals within that budget and within that content mm -hmm. right so like as simple as like oh I'm pushing my music video okay great is it out or is it coming out can we see the video okay once we see the video then we can know like is it going to get approved for YouTube ads no it has a curse word in it or it has a girl in a song like that can't be approved for YouTube ads so once we see the content then we can know like how can we actually market this content because it, if it's not going to get approved for YouTube ads, it might not get approved for Facebook or Instagram. So we might have to go the YouTube playlisting route. Like all those intricate details of understanding how we can even help you all comes down to understanding like what content do you have and what are we marketing for you, you yeah. know? Um, and we really do try, like at the beginning, we did work with a lot of indie artists, like I would say 90% indie artists. And it was very scattered. Like it was working one song, one video, one this, one that, but now we really try and work with artists where we create a full like 180 marketing plan for them where it's like we're doing everything we're doing ads we're doing a little bit of pr we're doing a little bit of radio we're doing digital marketing on spotify youtube apple mm -hmm. we're hitting all the mediums because i feel like nowadays it's about everything coming together as one um so even if you're indian you're not hiring an agency same thing i would say try and spread it out you know what i mean like obviously figure out what your dominating apps are like pick your top three, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on Instagram, TikTok and YouTube only. That's fine, but spread them across a little bit. Cause I find the other issue too, is like too many artists focus on like one platform and then they grow a bunch on that platform. And then it's really hard to convert people out over to other places. But yeah, for us, it's very similar. I mean, just making sure you send us as much information as possible, always including a song link or a video link or some sort of link and we personally like don't expect you to like send us your mp3 like you know put it yeah. on a soundcloud private listening link so we can strictly just listen to it and then same thing if we're the not not the right fit then you can send it to ola and she can listen to it like you can send it to whoever you need to it's not like you know what i mean you're you're piling up people's emails with like mp3 downloads and stuff like yeah. that so i think being organized and then sending us everything you have those are like the two main things we're kind of looking for when we work with somebody so you, content have king, you know Go again, please. Sorry. Content king. Like yeah. without content, yeah. like it's really hard to accomplish a yeah. lot. So you actually touched on uh, something that I also wanted to go into right after this is how does, uh, I guess Ole, you could start us off on that. Um, how does someone know that this publicist is right for them? What are some of the things, or rather, what, what are some of the things that they should look out for? So um, even discussing with the artist managers that we had on a couple workshops ago, it was there are certain managers out there that will promise you that they're gonna make you a star and you invest all of this and all this time, all this energy, and then they ghost you or they don't make anything happen. So what are some of those things that an artist can look out for, especially an artist that's not signed to a label, may not have that kind of 
um, those extra eyes for them? What are some of, the, especially from the publicity perspective, um, what are some of the things that they would look out for from an organization or a PR representative who is promising to help them out? Yeah, that, that is an awesome question. Um, I think, uh, you know, to begin, there's no guarantees in publicity mm -hmm. as well, you know, because you're reaching out to other people. And, and uh, typically in media, it's very, uh, uh, um, sometimes very sub subjective in the arts coverage, right? So other people have to, to, to dig that too. So although it, it can be very um, unpredictable at times, um, I think what to, to look out for is, um, is the agency the right one for you? As Lynn mentioned too, we, you know, sometimes our artists want solely digital marketing and they, they are looking for an agency that will either just do that or do that and secure interviews, right? So um, th there, it's being clear about what your needs are. Are you looking for certain radio outreach? Are you looking for um, digital marketing and commercial radio? Are you looking to do interviews with print outlets only? Um, what kind of coverage are you looking for? Um, for, for example, uh, at Indoor Recess, we cover national publicity. So we uh, only cover Canadian media um, with the exception of Canadian uh, freelancers for international publications, which we do have some relationships with as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the scope of what we cover. So um, an artist may be looking for that or, or they may have us as their Canadian publicist and then have a uh, publicist that works on their UK and US press, things like that. So it's looking at what your needs are, looking at the agency and what they cover. What, what does that company cover? Does it fit what you're looking to do? Does it align with your goals? Um, that, that is a strong one as well. Uh, and then when it comes to scheduling and strategy, is the agency able to take it on? Uh, are you also able to meet the agency's deliverables in the campaign as well, time-wise, right? So um, do, do, do your schedules align? Are you able to do that? Um, and, and in addition to that, with, with needs and how you can connect to certain agencies or companies, um, look at what their current client roster is as well. Have they worked with artists that are in this in the similar vein of the sound that you have, um, maybe artists that you look up to, maybe artists that inspire you or have influenced you over time. Do they get where you're coming from? You know, uh, which also equates to, you know, might they have relationships with outlets that are your dream outlets of uh, having press coverage in or outlets that have covered artists that you relate to or admire. So that's a strong one as well is like having that uh, mutual understanding of um, does the agency get uh, my music and do they offer the services that align with what my goals are and what my needs are so and for you Lynn how can an artist protect themselves so to speak um I know even for me as an artist every week there's a message saying hey I am Karis knowing that they took it straight off Instagram um we've been looking at your work we really like your work we can do this this is that um messages about our packages so what are what are some of those things that an artist can look out for to kind of uh protect their investment in their marketing i mean i think definitely everything ola said for sure you know mm -hmm. making sure you're doing your research and like you said understanding what that company offers and does it align with what i'm actually looking for and then i think also doing research i mean especially for digital marketing because i feel like publicity you could be a little bit safer. Like I can hit up Ola and be like, what have you accomplished? And they can show me press articles, right? Yeah. But with marketing, I feel like there's so many marketing agencies that claim like, oh, we did this, we did that, but like their name's not on anything. So it's really hard to kind of gauge like, what have they actually done? Mm -hmm. So for me, I always tell artists like, do your research, you know? Like just because a company's really cheap doesn't mean that they're going to get the job done. Like you can easily lose money that way and just get sucked into a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to always be in fear to work with a marketing agency because you're going to be like, well, where's my money going to go? What's going to happen? So I think like doing your research in the sense that like, if they claim like we've worked with this, this, this artist, go and reach out to those artists or go and look at what those artists numbers look like. What's the success on YouTube look like? What is their Facebook, Instagram, Spotify look like? Like, what are their numbers look like? Because obviously digital marketing is about 
getting you in front of an audience and getting that audience to listen to you. So if you're claiming that you help this artist build some type of success, like, like show me that success you've built. Even like I tell artists all the time, like, don't be scared to like, like there's tons of artists on my website. You could literally directly message them and be like, Hey, like, have you worked with Lynn from Icon? What was your experience? And they'll tell you exactly what their experience was, you know? So I think doing your research and really making sure that you figure out before even working with that company, that they're the right company and they're actually going to be able to achieve results for you because i've seen too many companies out here where artists are just throwing 200 bucks 100 bucks because that's an easier goal to get in terms of monetary value but then they lose that money and it's like well that sucks because that 200 bucks could have went towards a bigger mm -hmm. campaign with a legitimate agency you know so i think doing your research and then also having conversations in terms of like alignment like you were saying right like what are you trying to do do we have availability for that and if we have availability, what does that availability look, availability look like? Like, are we also working 10 projects at the same time we're working you? Because mm -hmm. that's super important too. Because even though I might be able to do amazing results, if I'm working 10, 15 projects at one time, like you're only going to get 20% of my attention because I have to spread it across so many different things. So I think a lot of times too, you got to be careful and, and don't be scared to ask those types of questions. Like, what is your availability look like? Because I might say yes to taking it on, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a ton of other things happening, you know? Yeah. So I think making sure those things align as well. Um, and I would say in this day and age, if possible, try and get a referral to yeah. the business. Like, I'm not joking. I've never in my life run an Instagram or a Facebook ad to promote my business and get sales. Never, ever. My business is 100% referral. Everybody who comes to me is through an artist I work with or this a and r told me your name or whatever so with us like that's how we've always operated and that's how we've stayed on top of the game you know because we do good business and then that good business is told to somebody else and then mm -hmm. you know um especially with some of my artists that are like verified and stuff like people dm them all the time like oh my god how did you get these numbers how did you do this and they're like oh i worked with this agency you know so i'm sure it's the same with lola like when an artist is getting a bunch of press like those other artists are going to see that and be like, where are you getting all this press? How is this happening? How are you doing this? So when you reach out, ask those proactive questions, like who exactly are you working with? And I personally would way rather work with someone who I got referred to that person to um, rather than just find a random company. I mean, if you have to, of course, do that, but do those other essential steps first of like doing your research and stuff. But ultimately, if you can get a referral, I feel like that's the best because then also, I feel like it kind of creates that immediate relationship where like if I've worked with a previous client and they've brought me a ton of business and we've done really successful results together and mm -hmm. they reference another artist to come work with me, I'm instantly going to have like a baseline of like respect and time and attention to that person because I'm like, oh, you came from this guy. I know him. I really like him, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's one of those, it's almost like a kind of like an influential like push towards you you know yeah. as opposed to just like if you're some random person that came out of nowhere I'm gonna question you a bit more and kind of figure out like who is this person should I work with them what is their values because you know um as a company especially being a woman like I feel like it's really important for us to make sure we're getting behind projects we really believe in yeah. and not just like everyone is throwing money at us you know we've turned down a lot of big projects and a lot of big money just because we didn't believe in the message or the music or whatever you know so I think it goes both ways, um, but I think that would, for me, be, like, the best sort of option, if possible, the referral route. And for you both, uh, just a quick question. Is it a project-by-project project, um, basis that you work with artists? I know, Ola, you, sa you said the word roster earlier, so I'm not sure. Is it, are there artists that you have that you work with, um, like, it's a long-term agreement, or is it just a short-term thing of project-by-project? Uh, project? I guess you could start Ola. Just yeah, it, it varies. It varies. Sometimes there uh, are more more consistent campaigns that run maybe with a label. So there might be like multiple artists that you work with through that label. So there's more like a consistent um, long term uh, coverage of projects. And then there are others where it's like an independent uh, campaign or artist. Um, or maybe an artist from from a sub label uh, or something where it's a project to project. So it all depends. Um, and all campaigns are really designed and curated per artist. Um, so a lot of we get that question a lot is like, what does it look like? Well, yeah, it, it looks different for every single 
person and artist. So everything is curated based on what the artist needs are, uh, what, what the sound is, you know, we wouldn't target um, an, a media outlet that wouldn't be a fit for your sound or your story. So um, that it, it varies really, but uh, it ranges from both, I'd say, yeah. And for you, Lynn? Same, definitely a case by case basis. I mean, some artists, like you said, that have a plan, we work with them for six months plus to hit that those goals month over month because every month they're they're continuously pushing a piece of content. Mm -hmm. And then there's other artists who just come to us and are just working one single video or one single song based on sometimes budget restrictions or just based on the fact that they don't have a super long-term plan, which is okay too, you know? Um, yeah. So we kind of look and figure out like, I always say, you know, one of my like famous things is like, I'm always like, okay, we need to figure out what level you're at and what level you want to be at. Like, where do we, where are we taking you from where you are? Because mm -hmm. I never want someone to come in at this level and stay at this level. We ultimately want you to take you to one, at least one or two levels up from where you currently are after we finish a project with you. So whether it's just an individual project or month over month, um, I think it really just comes down to the person specifically and, and once again, what they're trying to accomplish, right? Some artists have a big team, some artists don't. So, you know, it all comes down to different factors. Makes sense. So we will be crossing over into our Q&A section shortly. Uh, so I know there are a couple questions in the chat and the official like Q&A um, designated area. So feel free to start putting your questions in as they come to you. Um, but I did want to ask if there's any general takeaway that you do want to leave for our participants um, before we end the section. Any tips or any recommendation, any hack that you can leave our attendees with? Lynn, I guess you could just pick up. <laughs> Sure. Um, honestly, I think the biggest success you're ever going to have in your music career in general, not just marketing, because I think your marketing and your PR and everything ties back into you, period. We can't do an amazing job if you don't give us a plan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you don't have content, if you don't have a strategy, if you don't know what you're doing and what you want to do and how you want to roll things out, it's very hard to achieve the results you're looking for because everyone around you kind of feels a bit scattered because they're not 100 percent sure what the plan is you know so i think artists like the biggest takeaway from 2020 is like try and i know it's hard because we're obviously going through so much but try and look at the positives of like now i have so much time to work on my plan like i'm going to take two hours every day or an hour every day and just focus on my plan like do i want to drop a single and then after my single I'm going to drop a video teaser. I'm going to drop this. I'm gonna, like, what are you going to do every single month to make people recognize you, engage with you and remember you and become a fan of you? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, like now with the amount of content we consume every day, um, they just did like a marketing stat. And it was like, someone has to interact with you a minimum of 12 times before they actually remember you like as a long-term memory, because we are seeing so much content every day. Like, and in the same uh, marketing stat, it said that like back in like the 60s, you would only see like 10 pieces of advertisement content daily. Now, in like in the age we're in, they're saying that most average people see anywhere from 200 to 500 pieces of content every single day in terms of advertising content, not even regular friend content, just advertising content. So it's very overwhelming, you know? So I feel like you have to just have a month over month strategy. And even if you're not putting a song out or a video or like anything that month, still try and figure out ways like to connect with people. You know, maybe you could have like a Zoom party for like a certain exclusive amount of fans, you know, and just vibe out with people on a Friday night and like everyone's at home drinking wine, whatever. Like you could figure out different ways to do cool things every month to really keep yourself in the present, um, especially because I don't feel like your competition is the next indie artist. I feel like it's the biggest artists that have the most money. They're taking up the most space. You know, you're trying to push them out of the way to make space for yourself. So I think it all comes down to just having a plan. And I think if you have a plan, you can accomplish anything you want marketing wise, because once you have that plan, I can easily fall into that plan. Ola can easily fall into that plan. You can really figure out what pieces you're missing and put those pieces into place. Mm. Anything you want to leave us with Ola? Yeah, to echo uh, what Lynn shared, super strong. When you show up uh, 
for others prepared, meaning your team, you're, you're showing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that, that does include that plan. That does include that uh, understanding for clear collaboration with your, with your, your team, right? It, 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 it does all come down to you as the artist, but your team is a huge component of, of that success and meeting those goals. So if you show up prepared, if you show up um, with that strategy and with the content, and you are also showing up to meet those deliverables and make sure that everyone is is working in tandem. You know, it, it goes both ways. It goes always in this case, and 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 there are many cases we work with various um, people. You know, whether it's a manager or someone on a digital marketing team, um, a label, to a graphic designer, um, music video director. There, there's so many moving parts. So if you are showing up for others, you're showing up for yourself and that of your success as well. Um, staying creative is super important, especially right now, like staying innovative, not necessarily feeling that pressure to do what everyone else is doing, but maybe do some research and see how you can spin it to fit your own identity and who you are to share your story in a meaningful, um, compelling way. Um, you know, we've seen some really unique approaches to what artists have been doing. Um, even, even, you know, with us, we work with an artist that released an EP as a visual, like a visual project. And there is a music video for every single song on the EP. So it's, mm -hmm creating that visual structure because people are so um, in tune with watching things right now. So thinking of, thinking more around how to make it more engaging uh, through various mediums and making it special and unique to who you are. Um, so I think that's important, doing your research, staying creative and um, having that strategy and showing up for your team members to collaborate, um, you know, in, in, that, in that space is, is super important. And just also, you know, on a not so corny note, believing in yourself and not letting, not letting the noise get to you too much, because I know it's a lot right now. So as long as you just stay true to your voice and your art and uh, sorry for the honking in the train outside earlier, <laughs> you stay true to who you are, then, then you're, you're gold. So, yeah. Thank and I just want to quickly add to that too and say that like, I think artists also need to realize that we are in a really beautiful place in terms of being organized and like being on the edge of things mm -hmm. the small little thing can be game changers like um just like a small side note like because i a lot of artists come to me all the time with like oh, i really struggle to organize my social media content um apps will change your life literally there's an app for everything if you want to break good habits there's an app for it if you want to organize your social media, there's an app for it. Um, we personally, with like my own artists, we use an app called Planoly. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's lots of them. There's like one called like like Later, where you can like like schedule posts and stuff. But like, what I love about Planoly is like, we'll go in and we'll upload all the photos. And then you can organize the photos to see how they look in a three pack grid. So as an artist, like you're a visual person, you know what I mean? You're creative, that's creating for you, moving pieces around, seeing how this looks, how that fits, how that fits, and also how it fits in with like the rest of your previous content. Mm -hmm. So like using apps, I feel like for artists, like when you don't have that team, because we talked about a team a lot, right? And I feel like a lot of indie artists, especially in like right now, like it's really hard to find the right team. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, even if I have a team, like we're just zooming and stuff like that. So if you want to really figure it out on your own, I feel like if you dive hardcore into the app world, it, it's a game changer and it will help you be that organized and have that edge that we're talking about because most artists don't do that they just think okay on Tuesday I'm going to post at this time because that's a good engagement time but they don't proactive and then they're about to post and they're sitting there what am I going to write as a caption oh, you know and with Planoly same thing you can write your captions and save them and set a reminder so when it's time to post all you have to do is you go copy and paste you, it's like you don't even have to think about it Mm -hmm. And then if you're having a bad day on the same day you have to post, it's like, I don't care. I already wrote my caption. I already know what I'm trying to say. And also I feel like it takes off that pressure of what you're talking about, which is like, now I can be more creative because I can yeah. proactively think long-term about what, what do I really want to say here? What do I really want my audience to know? What am I trying to get people involved in? Because I find when I, my captions personally, when I take time on them and really write out and really like read and edit them, 
they get way more engagement and way more comments and way more, you know what I mean? People asking questions as opposed to when I come up with something quick, a little one liner and I post it, it's not as engaging. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. you can tell that I didn't really think it out too much, you know? Amazing. So I just want to put that piece out there too. Cause I feel like artists tell me that all the time. Like, Oh, like I'm, I'm not organized on socials cause I don't have a plan. It's like, mm-hmm. you can use an app for that, you know, and, and make a plan for yourself. So, when you are ready to get a manager or a publicist or a marketing agency, if you came to me and shared, here's my plan only grade, here's my Instagram is going to look like, I would be so impressed with you, you know, because that shows me that like you said, you're showing up for yourself and also that you have a plan and I can fit into that plan and just come in and assist you and take you to the next level super easily because mm-hmm. you've set everything up for success, you know? That is a great note for us to move into our next section with. Thank you so much, Lynn and Ola. Um, we will give both panels an opportunity to kind of tell us a little bit of what, about what their organizations are doing at the moment and what we can look out for. Um, I know we have three, about three questions here. Uh, the first one was from Sharice. Did I say that right? I hope I did. <laughs> Miss Bailey. <laughs> How would you approach a campaign on an album what is your step-by-step so I guess something tangible um and it's directed to both panels she says so Ola did you want to kind of start us off I know we talked a little bit about the process but I think she's looking for a little bit more um tangible details yeah I think I'm just reading your question Sharice uh Mm -hmm. first campaign on album um oh okay um well I think first of all looking at the amount of months that you're looking, you know, aiming to span across that campaign. Typically we like starting about, I would say that initial conversation, if you're not an artist that we're currently working with, um, if it would be good to start having that conversation about four months out um, to start planning. A lot of long lead uh, media or print media needs sufficient amount of time, about three months out for certain print publications, especially now we're dealing with a lot of different types of delays, unforeseen production schedules, changing and things like that all the time with the pandemic. Um, So having that initial outreach and having that content prepared well in advance of your actual release date is important to know first. So going back to strategy, strategy is having that kind of calendar per se of when you need all your deliverables available by and not to say that you have to have like if you're releasing three music videos over the course of the campaign like you don't have to have every single one done before you start it's just about knowing when to have everything ready for Um, so looking at that uh, looking at where you when you want to start that campaign and when you want to complete it which In our case, it's, you know, interviews are ongoing post-release day, typically, um, and and kind of working back, like looking at a work back plan around that. Uh, I think it's important to establish where your focus tracks will lie as well. Thinking about how many singles do you want to release? Will there be any visuals involved? Which singles will you push more, right? Um, When will you be releasing them? So sometimes depending on the length of the campaign or the amount of tracks, some artists choose to release a single every, anywhere between between two weeks and four weeks, depending on what your campaign looks like. It really varies person to person, but establishing that, where are your focus tracks, right? If you have a track that defines the EP or album and it's like the the, the track that uh, shapes the narrative and it has a really cool cinematic visual and you want to put a lot of energy into that, then maybe strategize that around being, you know, the introduction to the campaign and going out with a bang or looking at a way to introduce the album and introduce the news that you are releasing something and kind of getting the initial marker in and that step around it. And then thinking about that content that you're going to be releasing towards the closure and the release day. Like, how are you going to wrap and tie everything up with a bow um, and and really solidify that before you get the full project out into the world. But it's looking at your, your focus tracks. It's looking at any visual assets or special things you might have running with that in tandem like are, you know are you going to be doing a virtual show closer to, the, to your release or on your release day like how are you going to build momentum towards that like what assets and what type of content are you going to be utilizing in advance of your release day so i think it all stems really to a work back plan is is 
establishing the date of delivery of release of that project, that single, that video, whatever it may be, and then working back and looking how you're going to execute up until that time. But typically it would always say, you know, it's good to have for an album about four months out to start that work back plan, whether it's for yourself and then with the team, maybe about three months, and then you kind of take it from there. Um, and there are different strategies involved in, around different types of media outreach and what are calendar dates of when we start and finish um, that uh, solicitation and, and facilitation of that process. But I think, I hope that answers your question on that front. It is a lot, but it really depends on, on the project and the situation, but uh, I hope I answered your question. I'm guessing it'd be similar for you, Lynn. Anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, what I would say on top of what you said, because everything you said is absolutely perfect i agree it's really about your timeline your strategy mm -hmm. um preparing yourself with the content knowing what you're going to do each month before the album drops once the album drops after the album drops because once again it comes back to attention span right if i just drop a body of work like why is anybody going to pay attention to that four or five months after it's dropped like you have to really think about leading up and after so what i would personally say from a from a digital standpoint is i personally unless you have a massive audience i would not drop an album what i would do is i would do a waterfall strategy so let's say i look at things in terms of a year because everyone thinks a year is a long time but really it's only 12 months right so if i decided to drop a single every second month that's only six songs for the entire year that's nothing six songs is what's probably going to be on your album. You know what I'm saying? That's, a, that's mm -hmm. a really a joke, to be honest, because like you said, December, nobody touches December. So November is kind of like your last month. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even push in November. I would kind of go for something like end of October and then use November as like your promo and then end for December. So what I would say is I would say like, use a waterfall strategy in the sense that if you do want to drop an EP or an album, start with like, let's say February. February, you drop a single. And then you have content around that single and you push that single for about 60 days, whether you're doing press, you're doing digital marketing, you have different type of assets. Maybe the first month you drop the audio, second month you drop the video, like have, have a lot of content around the single. Two months later, April, drop mm -hmm. another single. We're coming in the summer now. You know what I mean? And then maybe if, for example, if it was a six track EP, I would do a waterfall strategy for three songs to be singles and then the other three songs to be on the album. So what I would do is I would drop three songs leading up to like summer. I would drop a summer track. I would let it ride out for the entire summer. And then September, October, I would drop the album, which included those three singles plus the bonus three, four, five singles, whatever that's going to be on the rest of the album that hasn't come out yet. So all that traction you built up on those three singles packages into your album. So it's not like when your album comes out, like you're starting again from like ground zero, like you've already built all this buzz, all this media, yeah. all these numbers, all this content and strategy around the album. And now you're uh, around the single story and now you're introducing a package deal. So like if I found you on your second song, you released a third song, you've sold me on the third song and now you're giving me a bunch of songs. So no matter what stage I find you, there's consistency as opposed to if you just drop an album, like one single album, that's it. When I find you, it's like, oh, this album's already been out for six months. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There's not really a lot to engage with there as opposed to that strategy. You're now you're spanning all that hard work and all those songs into a full year of release and content. So mm -hmm. I would say going with something like that, I think that's a, a really good idea, especially during something like pandemic because like you don't want to just put all your content out at once and then you're like oh shit like I put a whole album out and now I don't have any songs left like I recorded all those songs in the last year and like that's all I have you know I would try and figure out how to span that out as much as possible and then like Ola said really making sure each single the album everything along the way has lots of content and lots of interesting engaging pieces to go with it to suck people in time and time again you know because yeah. I feel like along the way you're gonna attract different listeners in different areas. Like I might like your first song, but not your second or vice versa. I might like your first two singles and not your third. So I feel like by just dropping all of that at once, you're not giving people the opportunity to discover the different parts of you as an artist. And I feel like if you give them a few singles leading up to it, 
they're getting a little peek at each side of you and then they're going to be even more interested to dive into that full album because i think it's really hard for indie artists to really get people to be attracted to an ep or an album when they're fed a single a month from their top celebrities you know what i mean it's, it's a very competitive sort of arena right now in terms of music right everyone's just trying to get as much out there as they can so if you're an indie artist and you don't have that privilege of like going into a studio and recording 20 songs like you want to make sure your your content and music lasts as long as possible makes sense thank you so much guys um we do have a question here uh, this one, oh, this one's about distribution deals. I think this is a question for our next workshop, which is actually um, about contracts. Uh, we actually have Anne-Marie Dyer, formerly Smith, um, who's going to be talking to us. She actually taught me at Harris where I studied music business. Um, and I know that she's definitely worked with major labels and would have a whole lot more <laughs> to say on distribution um, deals. So that's directed at Frank. So if you... Want to join is like focus on your numbers before you think about a yeah. deal. Yeah, it's all yeah. about numbers, you know. Distributors make money off your numbers. If you don't have crazy numbers, mm -hmm. it's a no-brainer. <laughs> I think I think that goes for a lot of things. Um, working with major labels, it's it's about statistics now because yeah. um, gone are the days where a label is just gonna take you on and develop you in what they think you can be. I think yeah. now a lot of labels, just all the labels basically want to see that you've done the work and that you are already racking up the numbers on your own um, before they kind of come in. I think that shift has definitely become obvious now. Um, moving quickly through these, because I do want to answer everyone's questions if possible. Uh, so my question is, if I have used Tone then for Facebook, advertising in the past but I'm now learning FB ad manager should I keep going or is it more worth my time to forget it and just use tone then um my insight on that I'll give our panelists a, a chance at it too is that I think both our panelists have kind of harped on it's it's what works for you um so I would say explore both in my opinion, that was that's what I would do. Explore both and see where I'm getting most of the progress, um, where I'm getting my best results, and then kind of moving from there with that specific platform. Um, I wouldn't just throw one out for the other uh, just on the basis of, of it being mentioned. I would kind of work with both of them and see um, kind of small investment of time and money and kind of see what I'm getting from both before I decide one over the other. Um, any of our panelists want to take a shot at that question? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mentioned this before, I think it's about working smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. I think Tone Den is a smarter option because it's, it's someone else doing all the hard work for you. So with Facebook ads, it's super analytic based. So like, you're going to have to dive into every single aspect of setting up an ad. Like, age targets, locations, cities, all these different really niche things um, to build out a simple ad that you might only be spending five bucks a day on. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can jump on Tone then and quickly set up an ad and they do all the hard work, they set up the lookalike ads, they make sure it's successful. I think that's a, for me personally, that seems like the better route. Yeah. Obviously, if you want to become a professional at Facebook ads or you run like an e-com business or something, or like if merch is a huge part of you as an artist and like you want to really, really become like a pro at Facebook ads, do both, as you said. But I think if you just want to have a really good return for your ad spend, mm -hmm. I think you toned in because personally, like I, I'm like really good at ads. I'm like I'm not boosting myself, but like I've mastered like Instagram, Facebook ads in a lot of ways. I've been doing it for like five plus years. And I personally even still use Tone Den because I know that like I've seen better conversion rates from my Tone Den ads than I've seen from some of my own ads that like I've spent four hours setting up. You know what I mean? It's like, why would I waste four hours doing that? When, as you mentioned, Ola, it's like, I could be spending four hours in the studio. Like I'm a creative, I'm not here to, you know, like you want to have like a manager for that or somebody on your team eventually for that. So I think it's about just making the smarter decision and figuring out what's going to cost me the least amount of time and get me the best results. Makes sense. 
Uh, just our next question here. I hope that answered your question. Let us know if it did, if you need more information. Um, are printing physical copies of posters or flyers useful in reaching a larger audience these days or have they become obsolete? Any other useful strategies outside of the internet that you can recommend? All I think we'll throw this one out at you. <laughs> oh, jeez. Put you on the spot. I'm, on the spot. I'm pondering, yeah. That's, um, well, I'm, I'm the daughter of a graphic designer, so there might be a little bit of <laughs> bias around this. Um, ooh. Well, uh, it depends on your budget, I guess, as well, right? Um, like Lynn just said, you know, it's, it's about efficiency, it's about budget. Um, what is going to garner you the most outreach in a certain amount of time with with that budget and doing it in an efficient way? Mm -hmm. um, trying to really think this is a great question, actually. Uh, any useful strategies outside of the Internet? It's very challenging right now because um, we're we're um, in a time where we're not out as often. But let's just say in, in the greater sense of if we were able to do that and live a little bit more, you know, normally at this time as we as we would. Um, I think campaigns around uh, using different mediums that are not connected to the internet. I think it's very cool. Uh, we work with artists that have had murals um, done around an album campaign, like large scale murals. Usually they're backed by a label, and so there's there's a quite a significant budget around this. But mm -hmm. it's something that is very noticeable, you know, and it, maybe it's connected to a sponsor. Um, I think that's that's an interesting way to go around as well as like um, product brand sponsorship things like that. But from an artistic standpoint, with anything print or on the street, uh, I do think it is still very impactful. It's very cool. Um, there have been some really cool campaigns. Um, actually, a friend of mine who is an artist had a really cool campaign where. Um, they had uh, like graffiti stencils of the song track in the font of what the like the the single artwork was and the stencil was placed and it's actually this single came out like three years ago but when i walked to the rail path like there like the stamp is still on the sidewalk and every time i see it it's, and like this this uh the stencil has survived the test of time yeah. and it's wild because it makes you think like oh what is that right so I think anything creative that can be done around that through art or other types of print to catch someone's eye and even something subtle like not including all the information as to what the album or artist is about but you know maybe there's a QR code like I yeah. something like that I, I mean maybe Lynn can speak more to what the use is outside of the internet these days but once again, you're asking you're asking someone who comes from the visual arts world. So it's like, I do see that stuff as being very cool. Once again, looking at being creative. Yeah, I think I think there's so many ways you can look around that. Um, if anyone, you know, like how many times do we actually, I do, how many times do we actually look to stop on like a telephone pole and be like, what is that? Like, what's that art? You know, that, that's kind of neat. And you might want to learn more about that. So those are some examples. I think if you do have the budget and the capacity to do something creative around that, um, it is strong. And and um, I do know that there are labels that still put a significant amount of budget into um, a lot of uh, ad and creative arts outside of digital um, marketing or in addition, in tandem with digital marketing as well in a campaign. So yeah, it can be helpful, but you know, physical posters and flyers, I would say, in specific to that maybe more a bit more useful in the age of live live shows mm -hmm. so because you'd be posting people put stuff up on you know uh cork boards and billboards when you're walking to the bathroom at a bar and you might see it and you and you might pick up on it and say hey like i didn't know that that show was happening i'll, I'll, yeah. I'll check it so anyway that's where i stand but sounds good uh lynn we have uh i think kiona is asking for a breakdown of the waterfall strategy um is there anything that you could because i know you you went through the strategy so is there is there like a step-by-step -step that you could give us really quickly um or if you'd rather she connect with you is there something that you could give us as like a rundown of what you went through in terms of um having those tracks spaced out and um the content around them um, I don't actually know if there's anything online because it's kind of like 
a secret label strategy. Like mm-hmm. I've really only spoken to labels and like A&Rs and like big time managers about it. Um, it was first deemed the Rihanna strategy because Rihanna yeah, was makes, the first one to do it. it um, she came out with a single every two months and it's just like, she's, and that was one of her biggest years. She had the most hits that year. Um, and so it, it's a pretty secret strategy. That's why I kind of talked about it because a lot of people don't talk yeah. about it and it's not and waterfall strategy is like what the labels call it like if you told a label person or an A&R or some big manager you know like oh yeah I have a waterfall strategy in place they would be like how do you know about that like they would be very taken back so um I don't but I think now that you've mentioned it I maybe I'll make like an Instagram video or something like that and put it up to talk about it or maybe this is being filmed and I can pull it from this or something you know because uh I just look at it in the sense of like um spanning out your year every two months so giving a campaign 60 days um because I feel like after 30 days artists struggle to figure out how to keep promoting and marketing um and I would say finding like I I like to give it 60 days of breathing room because I always like to think of things like if you've never heard the song it's new to you you Mm -hmm. know so 60 days I feel like is a really good timeline it gives press that 30 days of like fresh new media after 30 days it's kind of fizzling out a little bit unless you bring them something new digital marketing we've been pushing it for 30 days um and then we can switch the next 30 days do something different and then it's like okay let's move forward like unless this becomes the hit and starts viraling Mm -hmm. like let's just move on to the next single um so I just say like if your note should be anything it should be try and space your singles out two months apart maximum three months because after three months like someone might forget um about kind of what you're doing or what's happening because I find like two months like you're still staying like in their eyes and ears and you're still like like here's something new here's something new it's not as consistent as like a major but I mean like you're still staying fresh and also I just want to give a really good example um of the physical posters and flyers because I was never really a big believer in that um Mm -hmm. because I just never saw anybody I personally knew that it really worked well for except recently one of my clients Viles um, she's from Vancouver, Canadian artist, um, blew up on TikTok because she is amazing at makeup and she's very out, she's a character, a hundred percent a character. Like every day she shows up as somebody new and it's just so, and you're so engaged in her just mm-hmm. as a person. Like even if her music was horrible, which it's not, but even if it was, I feel like you'd still love her for who she is. You know, you'd just be so attracted to her. And she kind of hit like um like a stunt on Instagram. So she moved over to TikTok and started blowing up on TikTok because she would do these like makeup videos or the famous videos where it's like you're in pajamas, you snap, you're in like a full outfit looking amazing, like those types of videos. And then what she figured out was like, she started getting a lot of messages being like, oh my God, can I get like a photo of you in this makeup or like, because she was only posting that content on TikTok and yeah. not on her Instagram because she wasn't really getting anything out of Instagram. And then what she actually did was she put together 12 different looks and then made a calendar out of it and then sold it for like 20 bucks and made like a ton of money off of it. And like, that's really cool because like everyone uses a calendar, like that's super yeah. smart, like in my opinion, because I'm like, yeah, I would definitely have a count. Like I have a calendar on my wall, you know what I mean? And it'd be cool mm-hmm. to have a calendar with like this amazing makeup and this like amazing person like on that calendar and knowing that you support an indie artist and I feel like that type of print is very realistically priced like you're not just printing to give flyers out for free like you're actually making money back off of it so I feel like something like that if you you could get creative in that way I feel like you could really benefit off the print world because no one's no one's doing that like you said even with you know the sidewalk stands Mm -hmm. like nobody's doing that so I, I feel like it could help you really stand out but also really make other sources of monetary for yourself um outside of just you know streaming um and then one other quick thing too I saw as well which I thought was really cool um was I've only ever seen one person do this so maybe you can do this in your own unique way and it could still work for you um but obviously we're all trapped at home and a really cool thing that I saw um an artist do uh during the summer was um a scavenger hunt so even though it did involve the internet, obviously, they used the internet to leave clues, but then it gave a, a reason for people to physically go out and find things. So like, if that gets you out of the house for 15 minutes on a little walk to the park, like, great. 
you know what I mean? Um, and you weren't going, it wasn't in like public spaces or anything. So it was getting people outside, getting them interacting in a completely different way, but at the same time, like still being safe. And I, I thought that was kind of cool too, because then like, you know, people are finding little gifts and stuff and you could think of little ways, whether it's like leaving them a poster or mm. a, a t-shirt or whatever. Um, but I think that would be another cool way too, to get people like physically offline and like more involved with you. Like if you can get someone to go and look for something and do a scavenger hunt, like they're definitely your fans, you know, they're clearly invested in you. And I think that's really cool too. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, I think we have come to the end and that's a really good note to end it on. Um, I know someone did ask for their handles. It is, oh, well, you guys could drop your handles in here, um, but it's also available on AfroWave's feed. Uh, we have the poster up and we have their handles um, underneath their photos. Uh, as usual, the lengthy bios are posted on the Eventbrite page if you wanted to go back and kind of learn a little bit more background on the panelists. Um, and we do record the workshop session. So if there's something that you may have missed um, or if you think your question wasn't answered and we may have mentioned it earlier, uh, you can go back through that on our website. They'll usually be uploaded by um, early next week. Our next workshop will actually be next week, Tuesday, instead of Wednesday. I know we, we've been doing them on a Wednesday, um, but we did have to shift things around for next week. Um, and we'll be talking about contracts. So rights and royalties, uh, kind of what to look for. I know someone mentioned like distribution deals, kind of what that would look like, um, and just everything around contracts in the industry. So once again, thank you so much to our panelists and to our attendees. As usual, you can hit us up at AfroWaveTO, or you can message me at operations at AfroWave.com um, for any questions that you may have or any resources that you may need after this workshop. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Bye.